What up, what up, what up? Welcome into another edition of Green with Envy on Playoffs Eve. The playoffs are here. As always, this is your boy, Will. We are checking in. How you doing? How you living? Joining me today, as he frequently does, my podcasting cousin from across the pond, the captain of the Taylor gang, the one and only Adam Taylor. How you doing today, Adam? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. It's Friday. The playoffs start tomorrow. Um, I'm just excited, dude. I'm not even going to lie. I'm watching far too many Hawks games to be reasonable at the moment. <laughs> well, aside from that, I'm also excited for the guests that we have today. And, you know, I'm honored. I'm humbled. That for at least this week, I'm going to get to be the only podcast host that gets to utter the three most anticipated words in niche basketball podcasting. What up, Beck? Howard Beck is on the show with us today. How you doing, man? <laughs> Gentlemen, good to be with you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate the intro. Uh, I, I I don't know how Zach just dropped the ball on his own uh, gimmick this week. Uh <laughs> I'm, I'm still a little thrown by it, a little, little troubled. Um, I tried to course correct, try to say, whoa, 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 Zach, hold on. Wait, 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 before we get too far into this, what it, he was just too excited. He was too, Zach was just so fucking geared up for the postseason. Actually, so geared up for the play in. Like he was so yeah. psyched <laughs> and immersed in play in discussion that it was just, I just got to get straight to it. Um, that's, that's, that's Zach. But yeah, it was, it was, it was jarring after like, you know, I don't know, seven, eight years, more, more, whatever that I've been, uh, going on his pod um to suddenly like have that fall away like it's uh, i just you know lost my bearings a little bit for the week it's taken me some time to recover so. <laughs> I, I will say as, as the host of this show i totally get it because i have a little intro for adam i have a little intro for our other uh, our other co-host here greg who's not with us today and you know sometimes it just happens it gets the best of you you're ready to go but i do really enjoy that that intro each and every time i see howard beck is gonna be on the low post it's something that i've come to to really enjoy and so you know you've actually mentioned it right on the streets that's something that that people will say to you. you'll, you'll you'll get that from just random people on the street is that is that not true occasionally yeah um and the the the, the jarring thing there is that i'm just not used to people recognizing me when you come from a, a newspaper background which was most of my career you're just a byline in a, in a paper and my face is not in there and it's not online or whatever else and i didn't do a lot of tv or whatever but then when i went to bleach report you know, it's been it's hard to believe like 10 years ago that I left the Times for Bleach Report. And all of a sudden I'm doing a bazillion hours a week of video. The funny thing was for a time, at least because Bleach Report was still really new and the audience was very young. If I was getting recognized randomly, it was often from, you know, like, you know, guys in their like teens or 20s or whatever. It was definitely younger and sometimes actually really young. In fact, there was a time I was in Oklahoma City for a preseason game to do something about Kevin Durant in his last, what ended up being his last year there, but it was also the year he was come back from injury. So I was going to do a story about Durant's comeback after the 18 months or year or whatever lost. Uh, it was what, three foot surgeries in 18 months, whatever that was. And I went out there and I'm, I'm walking around pregame as I often do making the rounds um, just, you know, while guys are warming up and you're just milling about on the court and whatever. And someone's yelling out my name and it's this kid in the stands who recognized me from all the videos I do or was doing at that time with Rick Buecher where like we, we pumped out a like just a ridiculous number of videos a week and this kid was a huge Bleach Report fan and a huge NBA fan and a huge Thunder fan um and he like yelled out to me so I went over and I chit chatted with him and his and his dad um his name is uh Charlie Rico and his father's Jonathan um so I, I, I end up quoting them in my story about like the, the, the nervous anticipation of Kevin Durant coming back from injury and what's the season going to be and all this stuff that's hanging over them. And so I quoted them and I, I've, I've become like, I'm, I'm still in touch with them <laughs> actually all these years later. Um, but, but like, it was funny. Like Charlie is like, he's quoting back to me stuff from like our videos and he's, and he's doing like the gimmicks and he's like, all right, fact or fiction. Uh, Russell Westbrook is going to go for like, you know, da, 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 da. and it was, it, it was awesome. It was, it was great. Um, the, the postscript to that, what is that a, a year or so later after uh, Durant had left Oklahoma for the Warriors, I had pitched the idea of a story about like the, 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 you know, these broken bonds between fans and, and their star, uh, the star players that they root for. And I said, there's this kid, Charlie Rico, who I met. I wonder if I could talk to his dad and see if Charlie and Charlie was, I don't know, he was maybe 12 at the time. Um, I said, I wonder if, if they would, and I did. So I, I went out there again, I went to their home. Um, we talked about like what it was like to have your heart broken and yet 
the awesome thing, the amazing thing, the fun thing about the story, which I did write, was that Charlie Rico, whatever, 12, 13 years old, had a much more mature and philosophical view about Durant leaving than all the morons who were flipping out and burning things and <laughs> screaming and yelling and saying awful things. Um, and it was just a, such a refreshing thing. And it was great to just kind of see fandom and all, even the pitfalls of fandom through the lens of, you know, uh, an innocent, you know, preteen basically um who who just kind of had a different view of it like yeah I'm, I'm really sorry that he's gone he was my you know one of my favorite players and i've got like five versions of his jersey but you know i want him to be happy too like kind of thing and it was it was very cool anyway that's a very roundabout long-winded um way to say that yes occasionally sometimes someone recognizes me and it's kind of cool <laughs> I've, I've i've never wanted to be recognized as well because i know that a friend of mine recently started covering the kings and um he he said like the fifth or sixth time he went into the stadium as media he's kind of walked through the tunnel he's doing what you said you know just kind of milling around on the court and then somebody just shouts down to him like brendan and he's looking around like how did these people know me and he said it made him really kind of self-conscious for like 10 <laughs> minutes so when uh when i was there for the celtics game and i've kind of come through that tunnel and i'm hanging around on the court waiting for the game to start all i kept thinking to myself was i, I really hope nobody recognizes me because i've been really mean to people on twitter <laughs> at times and uh this guy this could go quite bad yeah. so it, it happens yeah. no listen i mean I've, I've certainly uh had some you know uh tense moments on twitter myself and and in general like there's you know you, you never know um you there's always a little bit of a risk you take uh by stepping into a public space and <laughs> And, and, and look, I never wanted to be a TV guy. I never necessarily was, was somebody who thought of myself as being out there in that way and being public in that way or being um, any sort of public figure. Uh, but you do this long enough and you get enough exposure and you go on enough, you know, I've been on documentaries and other things like eventually, like I, I still obviously have my anonymity. Like I am not Stephen A. <laughs> Smith. I'm not walking down the street with everybody knowing exactly who I am. Um, but um, I've gotten used to the idea that occasionally this is going to happen. And, and so it's just funny. Like I'll be on the subway and I'll get out, like, you know, coming out of a subway station, somebody, somebody will yell, uh, what up back to me or whatever. And then like people have asked for selfies sometimes, which is always like the funniest thing to me. Um, <laughs> but Hey, you know, like it, that's fine. Like, it's cool. Like I, I appreciate that people are that interested in what we do, uh, or that they appreciate what I do. I think, I hope. Um, but, but yeah, it's weird. Uh, a little bit, but uh, it doesn't happen that often. So I don't have to really worry about well, it. You, like you provide great coverage, Howard. So, you know, it, it makes sense that some people want to, want to recognize you, you for that. And so, you know, while we have you here, let's, let's pivot to some actual, some yeah. actual basketball talk here and, and let's get into it. And we want to spend just for, to set this up, we're going to spend some time talking here about the Celtics and the larger playoff picture. And then we'll, we'll kind of zoom out here across the league, but you know, we're recording this Friday. Like I said, it's the eve before the playoffs. Celtics are playing the Hawks after they upset the Miami Heat in the in the playing game. And at least what was a bit of a surprise to, to most people, us included, we were we were one of the guilty ones here that were assuming Miami was was going to take on the Hawks. We were already setting up for, for Heat Celtics previews. And I'll be honest, I was dreading it. I'm so sick of that series. Kind of glad to get something <laughs> new in here. But l let's start here, Howard, you know. You've talked before about, you know, punches chances from some teams that are, you know, lower down, more so in the West than we're really talking about the East. But let's just look at this series. Do you give the Hawks a, a punches chance? Adam and I gave our little preview a few days ago right after the play in. What, what are you expecting out of the series? Aren't the Hawks on like their like 500 consecutive days of being within a game of 500 or something? I was like I was the... trying to think of how to word that that they're kind of coming in hot, but uh, it's basically been one game yeah. above or below or at 500 for yeah. six straight months. Yeah, I don't I don't I don't buy them as as a threat. Um, you know, the Hawks they've they've been completely baffling to me all season. Like I know there was some risk in going out and getting DeJounte Murray and trying to make that backcourt work with Trey Young, but I thought there was an outline there or there was a, a best case scenario where they could really complement each other, right? DeJounte Murray can play all the defense that Trey Young doesn't want to. Um Trey Young can can play off the ball some and be a threat as a as a shooter. Um, you know, they they both can play on or off the ball. Like there's just you know there's there, there was the potential for this to be a nice complementary, very potent backcourt and besides that the hawks have always just had a lot of good talent hanging around right capella and collins hunter and everybody and like I, I i like their players I've, I've i'm perpetually and by perpetually i mean just the last two seasons ever since they, they made that wild unexpected run to the conference finals but the last two years it's like they're like the the lesser than the sum of their parts team and 
you know, I think the Raptors have kind of become that too. So like this happens sometimes, right? Sometimes the pieces, you know, there's a best case scenario where everything locks and everything clicks and you get the best of it. And then there are times where it's like, you know, everybody's deficiencies are just showing all the time or the chemistry just isn't right somehow. Um, like the Hawks are just overdue for a massive course correction. And, and um, I don't know what that looks like yet, but for the purposes of this conversation and this series, this uh, postseason, they don't, they obviously don't play enough defense to be a threat. Um, Trey young still seems a little bit up and down. Like I, I, I do want like this, the best case scenario for um, this to actually be a fun series, fun for anybody who's not a Celtics fan. You guys would, I'm sure just prefer the sweep. Um, but you know, Trey really, you know, you know, kind of, uh, you know, loves the spotlight and loved having that moment against the Knicks a couple of years ago in his playoff debut. Does he, does he find a little bit of that again? You know, does the showmanship and the bravado come into this and does that carry the Hawks a little bit to where maybe they steal a game or two and make this a series? I doubt it. I, I don't doubt his ability to do that. He may actually put on a show, but I still think they're getting smoked. <laughs> it's, I feel like it's, quite clear Jason Tatum comes into this entire series as the best player in the series. But yeah. by a very large margin, then obviously Jalen Brown, I've got above Trey as well. But one of the things that happened with Tatum last year, and I've personally put this down to just have balls to the wall. They had to go to finish second in the regular season and then having those deep series against uh, Miami and against Milwaukee. But once they got to the finals, Tatum looked like it was spent, right? I know he revealed afterwards to one of your to I think it was to Taylor Rooks with Bleach Report that he was playing with that fracture in his wrist. But what do you think he needs to do to be more consistent to be able to actually have an impact as big an impact in the finals as what we want him to in game one of the first round? Yeah, I mean, listen, he was banged up, obviously. He did just kind of some sometimes in that series just looked gassed, just looked like there was something missing. Right. Um, and you know, there's, if it were somebody else, there are certain players who you, you might look at and go, Oh, wow. Well, they shrunk from the moment or they, they couldn't handle the, uh, the, the, the spotlight, the defensive pressure, the, the stakes, whatever it might be. I don't think that that's Tatum. I don't, I don't, I didn't look at that series as being any indictment on him. Um, also listen, like there's a long history of young teams getting to the finals sometimes unexpectedly. And, and it was unexpected for them in the, in the sense that like the, the talent had been there for a couple of years, but as you just alluded to, like, you know, they were, you know, viewed as, as almost dead in the water, um, in early January or whenever it was before, before they suddenly transformed themselves. Um, and so it took a lot for them to get there. And they, they were making their finals debut against a team that had all the, the, the experience in the world. And sometimes you just kind of, you know, run out of gas. Um, I'm kind of chalking it up to that until further notice, right? Like, I don't, I don't think there's any reason to think that there was anything, you know, that, that Tatum was deficient at. Um, I don't know anything on, on this level. Celtics beat writers probably have a better sense of this, but I would also think that having been through that, this team and maybe Tatum himself probably approach the season a little differently, right? Like, okay, we, you know, we know what it feels like to be playing in June. How do we make sure we get like, that's, this is really what load management comes down to sometimes too, right? There's the injury part of load management that we discussed. There's also the pace yourself, especially if you're a team with uh, deep playoff run potential that um, you're, you're trying to, to pace out the season. Um, I haven't checked his minutes, but I mean, you know, may, maybe, and, and look, some of that's training too. Maybe he's maybe he'll he'll have trained differently this season. Um, I don't know. Well, uh, we'll 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 find out if they're in the finals in June. We'll see what he looks like then. But I don't I don't look at it as like something that Jason Tatum had to do differently necessarily. And, and when you look at this team, and you talked about last season's you know finals run with Jason Tatum specifically looking gassed, I think that could be a collective statement for for most of the Celtics team. As you know, we've talked about it a bunch here. Last year when they turned it around, Emi Odoka went to basically an eight man rotation from mid January all the way through through the end of the finals. So that's a six month stretch where he basically was running you know eight guys out there. And you know this year's team, you know as we head into the playoffs. They feel they feel healthier because Rob's actually available to play. Rob Williams is actually available to play and they feel a bit deeper. And so when I look at this roster, and this is one of the reasons that I think the Celtics are 
squarely in the mix. Them and the Bucks, I actually look to as probably the two best teams in the league, in my opinion, at this time. Obviously, there's a lot of wild cards out west that we can talk about later. But when you look to the East and you look to the Celtics roster, you know, outside of, of Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum, because we know they have to be special. If this team's going to win championship, the two of them have to do their part. Who else do you look to at this roster that they need to be a consistent major contributor for the Celtics to have enough to get back to the finals and then hopefully ultimately win the finals? I think the good news for them is that it's not one guy. On some teams, you have your two stars, and then there's like some third guy who's like, you know, a you know, sometimes star, a six-man type, somebody who's just, you know, you rise and fall with it on whether that guy has a good night. I think the Celtics, the, the benefit they have is – um, outside of Tatum and Brown, like it might be Marcus Smart one night, he might just get hot right on one of those those nights where he's just unconscious shooting. Um, it definitely could be Brogdon most nights. It could be Derek White. You know, you're you're gonna have an out the the stray Al Horford game, right? Like, um, I don't think it's one guy who has to do it. I think they've got either a bunch of guys who, if they're all you know, you know, putting up like ten or eleven points and a handful of assists and defending, the combination of all those guys is, is fine. You're gonna, you're probably gonna get a, a twenty something night, uh, twenty something point night from Marcus Smart or Brogdon somewhere along the way, or Derek White somewhere along the way. Uh, so I, I don't think it's on one guy, and I think that's their strength. I think they've got great depth, um, and yeah, they, they're they're healthy at the moment. Um, you know that that can change very quickly, as we've seen many times, not only with this team but but some of the other contenders. Um, you know, the Bucks are once again in Chris Middleton watch mode, right? Like. Um, some, and, and it feels like we're always like knock on wood, but like that's the Robert Williams thing, right? Like it's it's just you're, you're always on eggshells a little bit about like how all right, how many how many weeks is he going to sustain this time before something comes up? Um, but heading in, uh, I, I think the Celtics are looking as, as solid and, and as deep as anyone. I want to look at kind of what could happen at the end of the postseason. So one of the players that just seems to split the fan base down the middle there's constant rumors floating around about him, whether that be that he won't re-sign with the team in free agency, whether it be that Boston may want to move on from him. So I just want to get your thoughts on how it, how the postseason could affect Jalen Brown, whether that be if the Celtics don't make it to the finals or whether that be if they do end up winning the championship. Do you see him more likely to leave if he wins a championship or less likely and more inclined to re-sign? Um, I think it's neither. And I was fascinated when I saw this question um, that you guys wanted to talk about this. One of my just general observations um, during what we call the player empowerment era, or, or just, you know, I think it's kind of like the superstar mobility era more than anything. There is empowerment along other lines, but a lot of it is just us talking about the fact that guys don't feel any obligation to stay, to stay anywhere um, and they should go where they're happy, which is fine. But what does that mean? Go where they're happy. It, it, we, we think of it as being like, well, where where can you win the most? But that's not always the case, right? Kyrie Irving left a team that had been to three straight finals at the time that he left Cleveland and had won a championship. And he left, you know, he forced his way out. He ends up in Boston. And then he's on another team that could be in multiple finals and he, and he leaves Boston. Um, if you want to say, well, all right, Kyrie's a unique individual. Okay, fine. Kawhi Leonard left one of the best organizations in sports in San Antonio, forced his, forced a trade to go to Toronto, uh, where he, he didn't ask to go, but he ends up there, leads him to a championship and walks away immediately. And then you say, well, okay, sometimes it's about the money. Well, Kawhi Leonard had to leave money on the table to leave Toronto and Kyrie had to leave money. Or had to take less money because of bird rights to leave Boston for Brooklyn. Um, that we've seen various versions of this over and over. It's not just the money and it's not just the winning. and It's not just the quality of the organization. It's just whatever is most important to you at that particular moment in time. Um, especially for players in Jalen Brown's position who you were drafted to this team. You didn't choose the team. You may like the team. You may like your teammates. You may have great regard for the organization, it's still not the team you chose or the city you chose, and you may have other priorities. But the one thing I've heard about Jalen Brown, um, and this goes back, you know, this goes back a ways, right? When he gave those two interviews recently, and especially the one with Logan Murdoch of The Ringer, um, I was certainly struck, as I'm sure all you guys and all of your, your listeners were struck, as Celtics fans were struck, by kind of the ambivalence or or just you know, lack of firm commitment to the Celtics and even, you know, some some things that would hint at maybe wanting to look around. It struck me that he was that candid about it. 
I'm glad he was. I appreciate as somebody in my business, when people are candid, I prefer that to, you know, um, you know, bullshit, happy talk and, and, you know, uh, platitudes that are, that are not true. I would rather have candor. So I appreciate Jalen Brown being candid. What I've been, what I'd heard from people around the league over the last couple of years was this constant theme of not the whole Jalen versus Jason thing. It's not about whether or not they get along. It's not about whether they like each other or like playing together, everything else. It's more about Jalen Brown having made some of the leaps he's made in the last few years something else comes behind that often in this league. And it's even what we saw with Kyrie and leaving LeBron. Sometimes you just want your own space to, to, to really stretch yourself and be the leader of a team. Sometimes you don't want to be second banana. Sometimes you want the chance to be not just the, the scoring leader, the, the usage leader, but the locker room leader. You want your own team. And again, this is not some Shaq versus Kobe scenario. And obviously, you know, I covered those guys back in the day. It's not, you know, it doesn't have to be something where you, you don't like each other or it's a power struggle. It sometimes just means that your personal goals and your image of what your career could look like might not fit where you are at the moment. And I want to just put this caveat on this by saying, these are other people in the league talking about Jalen Brown. This is not Jalen Brown saying this, right? But often when you hear this stuff around the league, it's because people talk, it's, you know, teammates talking and then maybe it's, it maybe goes to their agent or it's an assistant coach and then he talks to his buddy on another team. We're, it's a gossipy league. If it weren't, uh, our jobs would be a lot less interesting. <laughs> um, so, you know, sometimes the grapevine is right and sometimes it's wrong. But that's what the grapevine has, has kind of bandied about in the last couple of years. Yeah, and that's the, that's the, the topic that, you know, a lot of Celtics fans know is looming, but don't necessarily always want to discuss. And of course, those articles put it front and center, like you, yeah. like you talked about. And, 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 and listen, I, I just think that um, realistically, there's like, I don't know what he's going to do. I can't read Jalen Brown's mind, but it seems to me like there's enough um, valid speculation here, which he has now given, I think, a little bit of, of substance to through some of his comments that, yeah, he's probably thinking about it. Doesn't mean he'll actually leave. Um, and we'll see, you know, does he make all NBA? Does that, does that incentivize him to stay? But well, again, that was I, actually going to be a question. I was going to ask you, Howard, yeah. did he make your all NBA team? He did. He did. Okay. Second team, um, third team. Um, I th think I had him second team. Um, it was, it was such like the, 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 the voting, uh, this year really stressed me out. It was, it was a rough, <laughs> it was a rough and, and for the fans, for the fans, did you put him down as a guard or down as a forward? Uh, no, I had him at forward. Yeah, I had him at that's forward. The, that's the play. Well, I kind of listen, I, I don't like messing around with this stuff. Like the league leaves it uh, to, up to us in certain cases, right? Like um, you're, you're not going to be able to reclassify Joel Embiid as a, as a guard just to, you know, free up a center spot or whatever. Um, but, you know, especially swingmen, guys who are, you know, you know, clearly by shooting guards who swing to forward or forwards who swing down to shooting or like that, that's easy. Like, I don't, I don't have any qualms about that but i was not gonna like sabonis could have been at, at forward like if you really wanted to get like jaron jackson jr as your third string as your uh, third team center or out of bio or somebody you could put sabonis at forward. but uh, sabonis played like 99.9 percent .9 of his time at center this year like I, I just i can't do that um but in the case of of jalen brown and given that there were way more worthy guards than there were worthy forwards i had no problem uh doing that but anyway, like I, so he'll be eligible for if he makes all NBA, he'll be eligible for that extra 35, 40 million or whatever. But listen, again, in, a, in an era where guys make 200 something million in a single contract and make hundreds of millions if you're a, if you're a star in the course of your career, it's no longer as big of a deal to leave 30 or 40 million on the table as it was 10 <laughs> years ago. And so I, I just don't think we can assume that a, a guy is going to stay against his other impulses just to take the money. And of course you can always force a trade out later anyway. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, and then also, you know, look, he's, he clearly has some misgivings about, you know, Boston in, in, in general, he's talked about, you know, the, the uh, just whatever, I, let's just say sociological vibes of, of Boston. Like there, there are some other uh, hesitancies he, ha he has there. Um, so I'll be fascinated to see, I'm not predicting anything, but I, 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 I don't think we should be shocked if he leaves, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's definitely on the table. You know, that's, that's certainly in the realm of possibility. But as we talked about, you know, 30 to 40 million is sometimes still 30 to 40 million. Uh, and so, you know, I know at least from a Celtics fan perspective, they're, they're appreciative of your vote for him towards all NBA because we know that that might go a ways in determining whether or not 
he stays in Boston. But but you know, with that, I, I want to pivot a little bit to to another topic that we wanted to cover with you here. So for the second year in a row, the Celtics are entering the postseason as a number two seed with a rookie head coach. This year, it's <laughs> yeah. Joe Missoula, and it's I mean, I I'm sure there's another example out there of a rookie head coach being a you know, being back to back years for a, a contending team. I'm sure maybe there's one, maybe there isn't. I'm not, I'm not actually sure on that, but with Joe Missoula, it, it's been an interesting ride. And so, you know, I, I want to do this, Adam, I, I want you to give Howard kind of what our vibes have been with Joe Missoula throughout this season. And then Howard, I'd like you to, to react and kind of add your own input to it, but to give you kind of our perspective of where sure. we're coming from Missoula to get that local versus a national perspective. So I'll let you, I'll let you start it here, Adam. Okay, so I'm going to leave the actual basketball take until the end of this. So the first thing is we feel like he's the the word Will uses is a cyborg, right? So we feel <laughs> like he, he there's times where he makes a joke where a joke isn't needed. There's times where he seems a little bit frazzled when he's speaking. He's still testing the waters of what human yeah. interaction potentially yeah. is supposed to is not, supposed to look like. <laughs> yeah, he missed out of like you know kindergarten. Uh, like high school, there's no human social interaction there. So a lot of people, a lot of Celtics fans kind of feel like uh, his personality is not great for being in front of cameras. Uh, we also find it really weird that he admitted to taping his mouth shut while he sleeps. That that just doesn't seem normal at all. <laughs> and then from a basketball side, we think his offensive game plans are excellent. We Like, you know, he's a... Uh, his offensive X's and O's playbook's great. His defensive playbook's improved. And he's improved as a coach in terms of game management for the year. But definitely, from the personal side of things, we, we'd really like to see what a national cover thinks of him. Because in the Celtics little universe, he, he's a peculiar dude. <laughs> I haven't spent much time around um, that team. Uh, and I, I do not know Joe Mazzula myself. Um, I... And you guys, I'm sure, watch – not only do you, are you watching more of the team, but you're probably watching more of those press conferences <laughs> than I am. But I've seen – I know what you're talking about. Like, clearly, yes, I have seen some of that. Um, the personality quirks. He's definitely kind of a different cat. Um, I also do think, like, it's interesting with young coaches in this league when they first get the chance to be head coach. And you you're elevated because you have shown – some combination of your X's and O's aptitude, your great uh, ability to communicate with players, um, your your kind of just grasp of 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 the of the franchise you work for, right? You you know you've got a good relationship maybe with the GM. Like there's all these different factors that go into it, and usually a guy gets elevated because they've shown they're they're ready as a basketball matter, right? And and two major things there, right? There's the strategy side of it, and there's the relationship side of it, communicating with your players. It's not until you actually get in that role, you know, the proverbial 12 inches to your right or left or whatever it is on the bench that, that, that uh, coaches always talk about, where you then see a guy's personality in a little different light and, and the way they handle pressure in a little dif different light. And it, it's, it's funny. You could be the greatest X's and O's person in the world, but not everybody's actually as well suited to sit in that chair with the, all these microphones in front of you and all those cameras and all those lights um, and it's an important part of the job. You are you are the primary spokesperson for the organization, especially in this era where GMs don't talk nearly as as much as they used to. Uh, to my chagrin, um, so you are the representative of the organization. You are the voice of the organization on just about everything, disciplinary matters, um, even even things like you know free agency comes up, and like you know you're going to get like Brad Stevens like twice or three times a year maybe. So in the meantime, if there's something looming, it's going to be. Uh, you know, hey, uh, Joe, what do you think of the fact that, you know, Grant's obviously seems like he's pressing a little. Do you think he's thinking about his free agency? Whatever. I'm just making that up off the top of my head. But things like that come up where, like, you're the coach. You have nothing to do with the contracts, but you are the face of the organization in that role. And so um, all of which is just to say that, like, there's a lot that has nothing to do with actual basketball and drawing up, you know, out of timeout plays. Right. You, there's other stuff you got to handle and we don't know if somebody can do it until they actually get there and then sometimes they have to ease into it right and some of them don't have the personality for it and like you mentioned adam the idea of just joe testing the waters are like maybe i'll try a joke here um <laughs> and and um you know it's it's just interesting because you know these guys they're gonna they're gonna feel their way a little bit and even if they're 
if, if it seems like maybe they're a little awkward with with us, with the media, it doesn't necessarily mean they're not doing a great job day to day with the locker room. And sometimes it can be vice versa. In fact, there are some coaches who just they they flip a switch and they're amazing with the media. And then you go, um, you you talk to players or their agents or whatever, like, oh, man, man, I love this coach. He seems so great. Blah blah blah. He's always, and he's like, yeah, he just he's not like that with the players at all. <laughs> he's completely different with you guys. I'm like, oh, so yeah. perception and reality don't always line up. Two different sides to this job, obviously, there between the locker room and what you get with the yeah. you know press conferences and such. With the few minutes we have left here, left here, Howard, I want to pivot here a little bit to the larger NBA playoff picture. So we're gonna do a couple of a couple of quick hit questions here with you. And the and the first one that I want to know is which NBA player are you most excited to watch during this post? Oh man, this is tough. Like it's more teams than players right now, just because I'm I'm curious. Like I'm like I'm insanely curious to see what happens with the Lakers having like salvaged their season from the wreckage and now have a chance to to do something. Um, I'm I'm insanely curious to see what the Kings do as a team that you know is, is back in the playoffs after like you know 50 generations of Kings fans have you know died off in the meantime. Um, like <laughs> the poor poor Sacramento fans. Oh, I'm very happy for them now. Um, I guess I would start there, actually, like Fox and Sabonis, right? You know, Deer and Fox, who, you know, came into the league with such promise and um, like like just this electrifying player, but they can't make the playoffs. And, you know, he's every year that goes by, he's getting more and more criticism. He's, you know, everything I uh, perceived of him over time and, and, and just my own brief dealings with him is a great kid. He is a really fun player to watch. And this is his first chance. And and Sabonis, you know, that pairing, that that partnership has has just been brilliant. And they play a fun brand of basketball. So it's 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 kind of stuff like that. Um, I'm just more curious to see uh, just how how some of this stuff plays out, because this is a very strange postseason, especially in the West. So I'm going to go with which team has the most to lose if they get bounced earlier than expected. I don't know what order to put these in. But um, the Sixers, Suns, and Warriors all have, I think, high, high stakes, right? If the Warriors flame out, like the 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 volume of the discussion of is the dynasty over and is the breakup coming, whether that's Bob Myers moving on because he doesn't have a contract, whether that's then does that trigger something with Steve Kerr because Steve and, and Bob are so tied uh, so closely together, whether it's, you know, Draymond Green opting out and, you know, Clay, like, you know, or, or or trading Jordan Poole for all I know. Um, if the Warriors are out early, man, that 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 conversation will consume the rest of the off season. But you know, the Sixers have a lot at stake because there's always the James Harden factor. Not only his ability to step up in a postseason and support Joel Embiid's efforts, um, which they very much need, but this weird, persistent, won't go away rumors of maybe Harden going back to Houston, which still makes no sense to me whatsoever. Not for him, not for the Rockets, not for the universe at large. It's I, it's strange, but I think there's one industry that's pretty excited about him coming back to Houston. I mean, <laughs> you know, quite quite possibly, maybe maybe they're pushing this the whole time. Maybe that's 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 the secret agenda that's going on. Um, but. But if the, you know, there's already been, you know, there's been speculation about Doc Rivers' job security for quite a while too. Um, and then the thing is, like, if you, you know, if you're changing coaches, and especially if Harden leaves, then it's going to reopen the door to the oh, is Joel Embiid going to be happy enough there and that kind of stuff, right? So, um, so there's that. But again, especially if they're out early, whatever early might mean, and probably anything in their case, probably anything short of the conference finals. And then there's the Suns, like. Okay, Durant's under contract for several years, so there's no fear in in some respects of like, okay, well, you know, hey, we, we got him in, he was hurt, he played a few games. If we lose early, fine, whatever. We're, we're you know, we come back next year with him there from day one in training camp with all these guys, we'll be fine. Okay, but the clock is ticking from the moment you got him, you know, because Durant is only going to play maybe you know sixty percent of the season each year now. That's that's the norm since he came back from Achilles. Um, and Chris Paul's already got a thousand miles on him, 10,000 miles on him, um, and is showing clear signs of erosion and, you know, like, all right, there's a window. Sure. But you spent a shitload in, in, in draft picks and players to get Kevin Durant and your window really isn't that long. So every postseason has great stakes in that regard. 
And you've really touched on it in that answer. There's so many different ways that this postseason can play out, which is what makes this next two months ish so exciting right now. And so as a writer, obviously, I think there's some storylines that are already building that you could see happening. But I want to ask you, you have a blank slate here. Maybe there's a storyline that hasn't even happened yet. What's the story that you want to write about this postseason? <laughs> wow. Um, story I want to write about the postseason. Um I mean, we already have going in that it's looking really unpredictable. And I guess I'll be disappointed if it turns out to end up being predictable. Like we never, it almost never, ever happens. Very, very rare for sevens to upset twos and eights to upset ones. And like the first round, like there are no upsets, right? Even sixes don't beat threes that often. Um, and a five beating a four is not an upset. Um, and yet this is a year where it feels very much, especially in the West, like there's great potential for this to happen. I will be disappointed if it just goes chalk, if it just goes to form, like I will actually be disappointed. I'm not rooting for any of these top seeds to lose. I'm not rooting for anything at all. But if I'm rooting for stories, is it a better story if the Lakers beat the Grizzlies? Yeah. And then going to the second round where they're either going to play the Kings, they're, you know, once upon a time rivals from back in the day when I was covering the Lakers or against the Warriors where we get Steph versus LeBron renewed. That would be fun. Like if I like, we say this all the time in my my business. We root out of selfish motives, and usually that means we're rooting for great stories. We're rooting for short series so we can go home. Uh, we, we root for no overtime so we can make deadline. Um, am I am I, you know, on some level rooting for the idea of of LeBron of, of either Lakers Kings or LeBron versus Steph again? Yeah, sorry, Grizzlies. <laughs> you know that like that's more fun. Um, then again, a Grizzlies Warriors rematch. Could also be a lot of fun. Um, so we, 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 win, we win regardless there. I guess the other thing is like, I have no stake in the, you know, the, the stupidity that is the grant, you know, some of the MVP discussion. I have, I, have, I have a role in it, but I don't have a stake in, in like who's right or wrong or who wins or loses here. Um, we do our best job to, 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 you know, pick somebody, vote some, to, for somebody based on, on what we think are the merits. And then the rest is up to everybody else to scream and yell about. I don't care. But I don't want to see the Nuggets go down early because it's just going to fan the flames of all the dumb conversations surrounding Jokic and, and his MVPs, whether it's the two in a row or whether it's a potential third in a row. Um, I, I, I kind of it, it's, it's almost the same for Embiid, although it feels like he hasn't gotten quite as much heat as Jokic has for, for postseason failures. But I just I don't want I, I'm 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 uh, averse to some of the stupidity in the discussions. And so an early exit by one of those two guys is just going to um, light up the the uh, opposite fan base slash critic base or whatever to then go all in on see you know they're not worthy of what i, I don't i don't even I'm, i i don't it's that's that's coming probably at some point regardless and i don't even want to hear it so <laughs> i'm gonna win my last i'm gonna take my last question with this because i know we're pretty much out of time so finish this sentence at the end of this year's playoffs everybody will recognize All right, I'm, I'm going to, this may be a little too abstract, but that the regular season was deceptive. That, uh, that Bill Parcells' old adage of uh, you are what your record says you are is actually not true, or at least it's not true in the Western Conference of the NBA in the year 2023. Because <laughs> the Lakers are not who their record says they are. They're way better than that. They may, they may still lose, but their record is, is not reflective of who they are. And the Warriors' record is not reflective of who they are. And the Suns' record is not reflective of who they are. And we have two, uh, we have uh, three teams at the top of the Western conference whose records I think do indicate who they are, but they don't indicate that they're actually fa favorites because when I ask people around the league, who's coming out of the West, nobody ever says Grizzlies or Kings. And it's very rare, if at all, that anybody says nuggets. They're all intrigued by the Suns and maybe the Lakers, if they're feeling adventurous and certainly the Warriors because of the defending champs. So, um, the regular season was deceptive. That's 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 my answer. And the standings as as they are uh, are are deceptive. Um, I, that's that's a really weird abstract answer, but um, <laughs> that's what we're going to recognize when the playoffs are over. Final question here, and then we'll get you out of here. What's your finals pick, and who wins the finals? Oh God, um, I really hate making predictions. The Bucks and Celtics. <laughs> you, you guys said it off the top. The Bucks and Celtics are the two best teams in the NBA going into the postseason. I think that's clear. Um, it, it's it's probably one of them is winning like and that's the other part too like whoever comes out of the west and it feels like it could be six or seven teams and by the way a, a week and a half from now we may be sitting here going like 
oh well so much for all that it's it's all you know it's we're, we're heading toward a you know king's nuggets conference finals or something whoever comes out of the west i think is probably losing to the celtics or, or bucks um if i had to make a pick right now um I'll, I'll just i'll just pander to the audience celtics over warriors in the finals how about that <laughs> sweet sweet redemption <laughs> we will definitely take that as a final <laughs> outcome however but really appreciate you joining us today anything that you got coming up here that we should be on the lookout for article wise or anything else so i'm uh i'm, I'm covering the the playoffs for the time being for gq gq.com so you people can find my stuff there you can also find everything i write on my authory page that's a website it sounds it's, it's basically author with a y on the end so authory.com backslash howard beck and everything i've written uh and, and, and that i will write for gq will be there all my old bleach report stuff my si stuff everything is all there um Find me on Twitter at Howard Beck. I'm also going to be a regular contributor to the Locked On Podcast Network um, on a variety of their shows over the next few months. So uh, you can uh, you can uh, find me uh, in written and audio form in those places for the uh, for the time being. Howard Beck, appreciate you joining us, Adam. Always a pleasure. We'll be back with more content. We'll have another in-depth Celtics Hawks preview dropping the morning of game one. So make sure to stay tuned for that. But for now, that's going to do it for this episode of Green with Envy. And on the way out, you're going to hear our guy, Greg Manakis, his band down here in Austin, Texas, Black Sheep Optimus. Peace. Love you.